Hey Joe, this week I'm going to talk to you about my teaching philosophy. For the first episode of Educating Joe, I thought I'd take some of the basic ideas behind my teaching philosophy and explain them to you in general. So this will just be a quick synopsis of some things that I think are important and kind of shape me as a teacher. And then in later episodes, we can go into more detail about some of the ideas that I bring up today. So you can basically break my teaching philosophy down into three main categories. First, I always remind myself that my students are awesome. I always want to come to class with the perspective that it's an honor and a privilege to get to teach my students and not that it's uh, something that I have to suffer through uh, and that my students are bad people or something I have to control or try to manipulate, but rather that they have potential to be amazing and awesome people. And it's my job just to kind of let that light shine through. It's hard to reach your potential when you're miserable. And so one of my big things is trying to help students enjoy science more. That way they make it more fun for me to teach. And then when I'm having fun teaching, they're having more fun learning. And it's just a cycle that keeps building it on itself. The second part of my teaching philosophy is since my students are so amazing, I always want to do what I can to show them off. Uh, so when I talk to my students, I talk about being transparent or having a window into my classroom. And what that means is I just want it to kind of take the mystery out of what happens in my classroom. Anyone who cares about what's happening, whether that's students who missed from being sick or an activity, or parents, or administration, or other science teachers, they should be able to look at what I'm doing my in my class at any time. And there's lots of different ways that I try to do that. First is I use Twitter a lot to try to take a picture once a day of some activity that I'm excited about. And if I have an hour and a half class with no activities to be excited about, then that's something I've done wrong in my planning and teaching. There should always be something that you can share with people who care. Second, my students and I record lots of videos and movies about different uh, processes that we're talking about during a unit. And so once again, those are things that they can review and people who care can watch. Third, we also have a student blog where we go to KidBlog and we write a blog post about various things that we've learned from different experts about different kinds of animals. All of these things are ways for people outside of my classroom to get an idea of what's going on inside of my classroom. This concept really led me to the creation of this vlog where I can kind of reflect on some of the things that I think are important and if anyone wants to see the reasons behind some of the things that we do, uh, you can just check it out here. Someone is going to tell the story of your school, and it might as well be someone who understands what's going on. It might as well be me. The third part of my teaching philosophy is that I should be doing things to help my students after high school, even if they have no interest in my content area. As a science teacher, I wish that every single one of my students would go on and pursue a career in the sciences, but I just know that's not realistic. I know I have students who have tons of other interests and talents besides just science. So I want to figure out what am I doing to help those students to become better. Uh, one thing I really pride myself on is trying to teach my students skills that they're going to need later in life, regardless of what they're interested in. For example, I really try to focus on collaboration, where you have to work with other people, maybe your friends, maybe people you don't get along with, and kind of develop those skills that you're definitely going to need later. Also, a big one for me is communication, both verbal communication and written communication. And then I also want my students to be good at networking and working together. Let me give some examples of things I do in class that kind of show you all the ideas of my teaching philosophy working together. If I go to the second point I talked about earlier about my students making videos showing different concepts, you can see how that kind of hits a lot of these main skills that I want them to learn. First, they're working in groups of five or six, so they have to decide who's going to be in charge of what. Maybe somebody's more confident explaining. Maybe somebody's more confident uh, showing what's happening. Maybe someone's not as confident and they want to be the one in charge of recording. They can find what they want to do based on what they're good at. It also teaches verbal communication, where you have to explain something in a way that will make sense and you have to do it quickly in the video that we're making. If you look at the written communication skill, that's where I take pride in having the blogs, where students are learning how to make a good paragraph, 
They're learning how to state their opinion and defend it with their own ideas, as well as ideas from other sources, and developing some of those skills that will be useful no matter what they go into. Hopefully that helps explain to you some of the things that I do. Next, I'm super excited to tell you about the best part of my week, the highlight for this week. I was so excited to finally get to tell my students that we're expecting our second baby in October. Now it's just been killing me the last few weeks knowing about this and not being able to tell my students. We've been talking about things like meiosis, making gametes and haploid cells and internal fertilization and all these things that would just live perfectly to me telling them. But I had to wait until we finally got to Punnett Squares, passing down traits, and I finally got to tell them that we're expecting. The way I did it is I came up with a Punnett Square, and it was about blood types. So I came up with something like, uh, my blood type is type O, my wife's is type A, our first child has type O blood, what are the chances of our next child having a certain type of blood type? And so it's so funny because like a few of them read that and they're like, um, are you trying to tell us something here or what's going on with this? And I tried to play it off until like they had done the work and I was like, well, it's just a real world uh, example of how you might use Punnett squares. Uh, but then eventually, uh, once they did the Punnett squares, I got to finally show them and I showed them the picture of our ultrasound, which was super exciting. And I got to try to like explain a little bit about how, how that process works. And it was really fun for me to get to do that. The struggle of the week is just the unit that we're in, Punnett squares. It's one of my least favorite things to teach because I feel it's a little bit outdated with our current technology and some of the research that we're doing now. We don't really use the Punnett squares as much as maybe we did in the past. And it's tough for me to grade. I kind of feel like I get into a rut a little bit where it's just the same thing every day where we do a few notes, then I go through some examples, and then they have to do their assignment and I kind of get into that routine. And plus, every assignment I give out, I have to grade. And that, of course, is my least favorite thing to do. Um, so I've been trying to keep up with my grading so they can get feedback so they don't make the same mistake over and over again. And thankfully, they've been doing a really good job with the work. But it's probably my least favorite thing that I teach all year. Last section of my vlog, I want to talk about an activity that I did this week that I wanted to share. Um, the one we did this week was about blood typing. So I have this kit where we use fake blood and fake antibodies uh, to show how you could do your own blood types. And so it's a little scenario where there's like um, an elderly couple who have a daughter who they want to give their inheritance to. And then a mystery man comes from out of nowhere and says that he should be part of the inheritance because um, they had him when they were in high school but were embarrassed. So he was raised by somebody else and that type of thing. And so they get to uh, put the drops of blood in the dishes and then they get to mix in the antibodies and check to see if there's clotting or not clotting. So one thing I really like about it is it is pretty much the same procedure that you do like in a lab, same kind of equipment, same kind of process, or if they were to buy a test, it's the same thing they do at their home. Um, so that's kind of fun to get to see that. All my students were kind of disappointed though because type O is the most common type of blood and that of course doesn't clot when you do the test. And so they kept stirring it and they're like, come on, Mr. Tim, we want it to clot. Um, and then finally it did. And it turned out that the person who claimed to be a son actually wasn't the son. He was just trying to uh, steal some money from their family. And um, so that was kind of a fun little example to go through with them. And they seemed to enjoy it. Uh, had a lot of fun getting to kind of show them that. And it was nice to kind of get away from just Punnett Square, Punnett Square, Punnett Square, and to do an activity with it. Um, so that was kind of one of the fun activities that we did this week. Thanks for watching episode one of Educating Joe as I talked about my teaching philosophy. Uh, if you like the video, feel free to like it or uh, subscribe. And of course, I would love any comments or suggestions that you can leave in the sec comment section below. And to all the Educating Joes out there, have a great week teaching.